Welcome to a special edition of the CEC Report. Today we're going to be talking about the concept of national sovereignty and the title of today's presentation is Kusa and the Sovereign Nation State. And I have a special guest, who, Elisa Barwick. Welcome Elisa. Thanks. Elisa is the editor of the Australian Alert Service for the Citizens Electoral Council, our national weekly publication. And she's a bit of an expert on the subject of Nicholas of Cusa, who was the philosopher and um, churchman from the 1400s who did a lot of thinking on sovereign nation states. Um, by way of introduction, let's think about this as a concept. Today, national sovereignty is a very big issue, which is why we're talking about it. If you're following the strategic situation in the world, you'll know that there is a major standoff between countries like Russia and China, on the one hand, that are insisting that their sovereignty be respected, and the people operating in Britain and the United States under the influence of ideas like Tony Blair's responsibility to protect doctrine, which are saying they should have the right to go in and conduct regime change on countries and not respect their sovereignty. So there's a big standoff over that. National sovereignty is also an issue when it comes to the economy because the, there's, um, uh, there's a big issue over whether nations have the right to run their own economic affairs or have a situation like we see in Europe at the moment where countries like Greece and Spain are being dictated to by forces outside their country on, in terms of what they should do with their economy. So this is at the forefront of world affairs at the moment. And the question is, why is it important? And we're going to go through that with Elisa's help. Um, before I introduce Elisa and Nicholas Acuza, let's just recap a little bit of history. No, nation states, Elisa, didn't always exist. No. You had basically imperial structures. And then beginning with the Greeks and the rise of the Greek civilization around the ideas of people like Plato, you had the rise of the city-state, where the, the, uh, the citizens took charge of their own affairs. And from that birth, we now have a world where nation-states predominate. So um, in terms of the thinking of how a nation-state should function, though, no one is equal to Nicholas Acuza. So why don't you tell the viewers who Nicholas Acuza is and what he had to say on this subject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nicholas of Cusa was actually a German cardinal in the Catholic Church uh, in the first half of the 15th century and he acted in various positions as papal envoy uh, and various other roles, particularly in the lead up to the Council of Florence. Uh, there had been a series of councils to bring together the churches of the East and the West and end the... The East, the East being the Orthodox churches that we know today. Mm -hmm and to end the capability for other forces to invoke religious warfare, etc. Uh, so Cusa played a role in that. He was on one of the committees of the Council of Basel, uh, the Committee for Faith, and he wrote a paper called on the Catholic Concordance for that, uh, the Council of Basel. And his idea, he really laid out very explicitly in that paper for the first time the basis of the sovereign nation state, which wasn't fully realized until 343 years later, to be precise, with the US Declaration of Independence. And we'll talk today about exactly how there is a direct lineage between Cusa's uh, notions in this paper he wrote and the founding of the American Republic. But in, let's look at what he talked about in that paper, in the Catholic Concordance. He laid out, really, for the first time, the concrete institutional form for the requirements of government, which was really the earliest precursor of modern constitutionalism to lay a legal framework of government itself. First of all, as the, the prior basis for this whole idea, he talked about the natural freedom and equality of all people which was very revolutionary at the time. He said, uh, since all are by nature free, every governance, whether it consists in written law or in living law in the person of a prince, can only come from the agreement and consent of the subjects. For if men are by nature equal in power and equally free, 
the true properly ordered authority of one common ruler who is their equal in power can only be constituted by the election and consent of the others and law is also established by consent. You're not kidding that that's revolutionary. I mean, this was effectively in the age of feudalism he was writing this. Exactly. And he said that the basis of that equality is the nature of man. That man, as opposed to an animal, uh, is, as he put it, endowed with reason. And you see these themes, as we'll come to later, coming through exactly almost to the word in the Declaration of Independence. So he wasn't, and just as a contrast, a lot of people today say we have, you know, we all have rights, I have rights for this, rights for that, rights for the other. Kuzo was very explicit that, yeah, there's a scientific basis for equal rights, which is that we're all equal by in virtue of our reason. Mm -hmm, exactly, our God-given reason. And so he said, therefore, every legislation, lawmaking must be based on that reason and on natural law, which reason is also derived from, from our understanding of the universe that we live in. So he talked about the fact that human beings have built cities and adopted laws to preserve unity and harmony and that they established guardians of all these laws with the power necessary to provide for the public good. And there's three crucial concepts in that sentence. Cities, which were the earlier precursor of the nation state, guardians, the earlier form of government, and the public or the common good. And that idea of the common good is what was unique and which really separated the idea of the sovereign nation state from the previous feudal society or a system of oligarchism, oligarchy meaning rule by few. Because un under oligarchical structures, the, the, the good is what's good for the monarch or what's good for the ruler or the, or the ruling class, mm -hmm. not for everybody. Exactly. So he then went on to describe the basis of a representative system of government saying that all legitimate government can only come from the consent and agreement of the people. And that representative system, he said, would be made up effectively of what today we would call a Congress or a Parliament, and he described it in this way. He said, for this purpose of the public welfare, the ruler should have the best qualified of his subjects chosen from all parts of his realm to participate in a daily council with him. These councillors ought to represent all the inhabitants of the realm. And he laid that out in quite a bit more detail, uh, which, again, for the time, he was way ahead of, of the curve. It's represented democracy he's talking about. Mm -hmm, exactly. Now, there's one other thing I wanted to mention about Kuz's, uh revolutionary ideas that made a dramatic impact on the advent of the nation state. And that is his theology, his theological ideas, and his scientific work. Now that's beyond the scope of what we can go through in any detail here today, other than to mention Kuz's discoveries relating to scientific method. And it is related to what we talked about a few minutes earlier with this question of the reason of man, and that being the basis of equality and the basis of laws and the nation. What Kuz did is he elaborated the basis of scientific method based upon man's ability not to merely put together an array of facts and sensory data, uh, Sherlock Holmes style, and come up with a deductive conclusion. He revolutionised that. He completely overturned that. And he said that the basis of human reason, or creative reason, was that man would investigate the universe, he would see anomalies, he would see paradoxes, and he would make what what Einstein and Max Planck later described as a leap of faith. And he would discover a higher principle which was governing and causing the immediate sensory data that we would see. And we would be able to thereby discover what it is that was generating that sense data and in fact come to know what we now know as universal physical principles. And wasn't Kuzer more than anyone else instrumental because of this scientific side of him in unleashing the golden renaissance. Absolutely, that, that's the crucial thing. The golden renaissance was a flourishing of this method of scientific discovery and you had people like of course Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, uh, Machiavelli, you had great breakthroughs in these areas from the arts, architecture, think of people like um, 
Filippo Brunelleschi, who was responsible for the beautiful uh, cupola on the Dome of Florence, which was an engineering breakthrough of the time, not just beautiful architecture, but in order to even build that in the first place. It took incredible breakthroughs in the knowledge of the day. Um, yes, yeah, science itself, I mean, people like Leonardo da Vinci studied the human body, they studied biology, they studied the sciences, so it wasn't just beautiful art. Uh, it was based on these principles, as discovered by Cusa, that man was capable of knowing and understanding the real universe behind what is merely presented to us by the senses. And it takes this, these ideas of statecraft, like um, uh, d government and uh, sovereignty of nation states, it takes them out of the abstract, because of course, um, it's one thing to say there's a common good, mm -hmm. but unless you can harness that creative reason of people to make these discoveries that benefit everybody in terms of the physical day-to-day, -day, how we grow what we eat, how we produce what we need, mm. then that common good idea is a little bit airy-fairy. Exactly. This is, this, the renaissance that flourished after Cusa is an example of, of his ideas and practice. Exactly. It was sustainable because these discoveries and breakthroughs led to economic breakthroughs and an economic flourishing which was unprecedented. All right, well, when we come back, we're going to talk about the backlash to Cusa's ideas. Welcome back to this special edition of the CEC report on Nicholas of Cusa and the sovereign nation state. So the revolutionary ideas of Cusa that we discussed before the break proved to be a threat and they were a threat to the ruling power of the day, which was Venice, the m empire that operated out of northern Italy. But Venice was a particular type of empire. It was a monetary empire. And it was like a little place after all. But by virtue of its banking was invented in Venice, as with other good things like casinos. I'm saying good sarcastically. I hope people pick that up. By virtue of its control of monetary systems that spread right across Europe and the Mediterranean, Venice was able to function as an empire and dictate to those nations, right? which of course meant those nations had no practical sovereignty. So the Venetians, Elisa, were not happy at what Cusa was peddling here. I know. And they were well and truly surrounded from the standpoint that they were, you know, just in this little area. And of course Florence was the headquarters of the flourishing Renaissance, which dramatically spread very rapidly with the kind of upshift that you had in the day-to-day -day life of the people, uh, advancements in the culture and so forth, um, you know, the flourishing of Christianity and various values associated with that. You had associated shifts and uh, build-up of military defences. People like Machiavelli mm. had pioneered new ways to defend the other regions from Venice. And so the Venetians at a certain point knew they were surrounded. And there was a rift that came about as a result of what to do about that. Basically about how to survive this. Exactly. You had the old faction, or in Italian, the Vecchi. And their idea was, we have to stick to our ways, the br brutal style of dictatorship. We can't give an inch if we want to survive. The other faction, the new faction, or the Nuovi, had another idea. They said, look, we're going to have to lay low for a while. We're going to have to compromise. That's the only way we're going to survive. So there was a, a huge fight and there was a, a lot of falling out. Ultimately, the old faction refused to change their ways and they uh, ended as a result of that. Ultimately, they were destroyed in the process. The new faction survived, but they had to make a double shift. They had to physically move out of Venice and they had to make a major ideological shift as well. Now, the physical shift took some time to complete. I mean, they literally went into hibernation for a long time. Ultimately, they shifted to Britain. The stepping stone in that direction was a shift to the Netherlands. Uh, but the, the shift into Britain had taken place as early, it began as early as 1601, when the Venetians installed the Stuart monarchy. But it wasn't finalised really until 1688 with the so-called Glorious Revolution, which was much less than a revolution uh, really than a, a foreign invasion, which was led by the Dutch Prince William of Orange. And in England, 
there were a host of very powerful English families that allowed this shift to be effected. Now you can read uh, the New Citizen that we produced on this, the October, November 2009 New Citizen for more information about that. Well, and spe specifically though, this was the beginning of the era of what they call constitutional monarchy, which has um, spread to Australia. We, ha we, we are a quote-unquote constitutional monarchy, which, which also trace our roots back to this. The Westminster 16, system. This system is the Westminster trace, system. Exactly. And so we think this is great and glorious for the common good of all, but what it did was it institutionalised this monetary oligarchism of the Venetians. Exactly. Um, and the corresponding ideological shift that I mentioned, uh, that was not a genuine ideological shift, but Venice realised we have to be a little bit more crafty, a little bit more sneaky here. Well, Cusa had set up a battle of ideas, basically, and they had to combat those ideas. Exactly. So what they literally did, Cusa's method, remember, was that man can discover how the universe works. Yep. We can figure that out with our reason. So, look, that horse had already bolted in the eyes of this new Venetian faction. They knew you were not going to suppress technology, you were not going to suppress development. So they said, okay, rather than restricting new ideas, new discoveries to an elite priesthood, which they previously had done, we're going to have to let people um, participate and partake of those new discoveries. We're going to allow technologies to flourish. We can't really stop it. However, they knew that they could prevent people from understanding where those discoveries came from and how those discoveries were made. So we'll give them the fruit of the tree but not allow them to know how to plant a seed and grow a tree. Mm. So that was their conniving way of, of undermining Kuz's, uh revolution in scientific method. Well, wasn't it really undermining Kuz's conception of the nature of man? Exactly, which therefore completely undermined the, foundation of the notion of politics. the sovereign nation state. Now, the leader of this push was a Venetian priest called Paolo Sarpi. And he, his writings were rather extraordinary in their attacks on Christianity and on actual science in favour of what he promoted, which was a real pseudoscience. He said in his private writings that Christianity was subversive of the established social order. In particular... Which is oligarchism. That's right. In particular because of its belief in the immortality of the human soul. Because to uh, that notion emphasises the future. Whereas man's purpose, he said, like animals, is merely to live. So he really equated man with an animal, which again is in stark contrast to, um, to Kuz's notion. Uh, now what Sapi did is he ran a series of salons and he picked up people like uh, Galileo Galilei, who was his protege. And basically they they plagiarised the works of other great thinkers of the time. But what they did, and Newton was one of the classics that came from this stable of Sarpy quackademics, uh, what Newton did is a classic example because they took the idea of gravitation as discovered by Kepler and they dumbed it down. So they put it into a mathematical formula such as the inverse square law and they said this is gravitation, you can calculate it, etc, etc. Of course, it ran into all sorts of problems mm. if you pushed it, you know, to any degree. Whereas, uh, of course, Kepler wrote a book in 1609 called The New Astronomy, which elaborated in explicit, almost excruciating detail, the discovery, his discovery of gravitation 33 years before Newton was even born. And that's an important point because Kepler's three laws of planetary motion apply to this day under all circumstances. Um, Newton, who is worshipped as this god, and his little formula is very restricted, very limited, and had to be thrown out very quickly once Einstein came along. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, people like this, René Descartes, various other examples, were literally Venice's attempt to take the most profound discoveries and squash them down into a little box and just say, okay, that's your discovery, you know, uh, and, and people would not really get the impact you might, be, you might use it as a formula, a formula in engineering or something, but you wouldn't have the import and the knowledge to take that any further. So that's the cultural scientific side of it, of the backlash, but we'll take a break now and come back and talk about national sovereignty in practice. <laughs> Uh, 
Welcome back to this special edition of the CEC report on Nikola Sakuza and the sovereign nation state. Now, Lisa, before the break, we are talking about the cultural backlash that the Venetians organised against Kuza's ideas. This, this backlash really took over Britain in a big way. Yeah. Um, the transplanting of these Venetian ideas into Britain was really enacted through the creation of the Cambridge and Oxford universities. Bertrand Russell, John Maynard Keynes, a whole series of creepy characters came out of these universities and took over academia. Um, you can read more about that in our October-November 2011 New Citizen feature, which is very extensive. The high priesthood, the Cambridge apostles are discussed there. The and schools the, of empiricism. And they're, explicit, they're explicitly anti Cousa's conception of the nature of man. Exactly. The empiricists, Bacon, Hobbes, Locke, they're all promoted where all knowledge comes from the senses. That's all we can know. That's the best we can do. We can statistically analyse the data and that's about it. Draw our conclusions. So we're, like, we're like little mini computers. Um, now, you've got some examples, though, of Cousa's ideas successfully put into practice as nation-state. Yeah. The first real example was Louis XI's reign in France from 1461 to 83, And basically, it was enacting these ideas of Cousa and creating a complete upshift in the economy. Um, just basic things that we take for granted today, like uh, having... Um, en encouraging tradesmen, encouraging investments in infrastructure uplifting people's living standards. Exactly, and, and the day-to-day -day things like making sure rubbish was collected, making mm. sure that you had certain services, etc., social factors. So it was bringing in basic elements into practice. Henry VII was another example that followed from that. Henry VII of England. Yes, from 1485 to 1509. Uh, basically, Henry took some of the best ideas from France. He was also being advised by a group of Platonists like Thomas More and Erasmus, and that unleashed the Tudor rena Renaissance. But the biggest example is, is the US. the United States. Now, this is where it does get interesting because the United States was literally the brainchild of Nicholas of Cusa, directly. Uh, Cusa had been in discussion with a couple of his colleagues, which included the Italian scientist Paolo Toscanelli, and it included Ferdinand Martins, who was the canon of Lisbon. And they discussed the idea of a voyage to new lands, they drew up maps whereby they later relayed those maps to Christopher Columbus in 1480. He got a hold of those maps. He went to uh, Portugal and he found out about Toscanelli who was there and he got a hold of the maps and scientific information to make such a voyage which at that time they believed would get them to the Orient uh, and in fact conducted that voyage which was successful in 1492. Now, the idea of Cusa was to create a nation state away from oligarchies and pioneered, pioneered by people who were keen to get away. And of course, that distance would help, of course. Help it survive and flourish. Exactly. And the uh, identity of those people as pioneers would also help because, as Cusa said, the idea of a nation state was based upon the principle of man in the image of God, of man as a sovereign creature. And. Um, if people read the Declaration of Independence, which was America's founding document, they will exactly. see Cousa's ideas there. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. All right. Well, there's a lot of material that we have on our website and in our publications that, that can give people more elaboration on this, but we've run out of time. That's just a, as a sample of, of where these ideas come from, but to underscore how important this principle is. That's it for the CEC report. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.